So uh, thank you guys for uh, coming here. It's a, it's a pleasant day outside, I'm sure. You know, there are many different places where everybody wants to be. But, but thanks for choosing to be in a place where it talks about mainframe and open source together. Uh, you know, paradoxical statement maybe, but, but we'll talk about it. Um, and uh, and uh, uh, thanks for the Linux Foundation for, for organizing and for, for uh, selecting me as a speaker. Uh, and, the, and the third thing is thanks to the entire team. Uh, there were a lot of people who worked on this one. Uh, I'm just uh, sort of representative for, for speaking on their behalf. Uh, so, <clears throat> and then, uh, so I'm sure all of you guys have a, a bank account or a credit card. And I'm sure you always wondered, uh, you know, how when somebody swipes a card, uh, you will see your transactions in your mobile app or a web app. Uh, so I'm at least going to partially unravel that so that you guys have a better understanding on how that happens. Um, so I myself am Seishi Gudanti. Uh, I've worked in the bank for around six years, uh, worked on uh, the data platform uh, previously. And this part of the presentation is actually representing that work uh, from while I was in the data platforms. Uh, I live in the Bay Area, uh, and then that's my kind of LinkedIn profile. And then um, I write, read, uh, travel, and then do photography. So that's that's kind of a little bit about myself. And uh, Venkat used to work for me, um, and. Uh, uh, was also part of the team uh, and couldn't make it uh, here uh, due to different circumstances, but uh, that's what this is about. Okay. So uh, a little bit about U.S. Bank uh, before we kind of get into uh, the actual technical presentation so that, that there's a context. Uh, U.S. Bank, uh, we, we serve consumers, uh, we serve small business, and we serve large enterprise customers. Uh, this talk is mostly about the consumer segment, uh, and that consumers are part of the consumer and the business banking, and these percentages represent the, the relative revenue uh, of the bank that gets from different business lines. So consumers are primarily in the consumer and, and the business banking where we have checking and savings uh, deposits, and then they're part of the payment services. We offer credit cards. Um, to to consumers, and they're part of the wealth management uh, because you know we have wealth management solutions and products to to the consumers. Uh, the last business unit, uh, the corporate and the commercial bank, we don't have any consumers there. Uh, so that's the kind of the landscape uh, on where consumers fit in. Um, and then if you look at the consumer transactions, uh, especially the digital transactions. They've been going through the roof uh, relative to kind of four years ago. And then they're across the board. Uh, these are just representative of a couple of them. Uh, this one represents the digital transactions and the, and the mobile deposits. So I'm going to explain a little bit about, you know, uh, these are not just like new customers signing up and then doing digital transactions. These are, there's a fundamental change in how uh, the products are evolving and how Customers' behavior is changing, and that's the trend towards the digital transactions. And um, and uh, the talk is about the mainframes and how we kind of migrated. And these increase in the digital transactions is probably the sort of the main driver, actually. And so now I'm going to sort of dig deeper into why the digital transactions are actually going up. Uh, I'll kind of skip that. Uh, so. If you look at the digital transactions, why are they going up? One of them is that the, the, the physical analog of it is typically less transactions. If you ever went to Blockbuster and then you know, rented, you probably would have one transaction for so renting it out and then returning the, sort of the DVD. You had two, two, two rows in some database somewhere. Uh, but if you are looking through like Netflix, you would log in, you would browse, you would browse for like 20 minutes and then maybe watch for 10 minutes. Uh, so, so the number of transactions that you're hitting the server is actually phenomenally higher. That's the same trend even in the bank. If you know anything that is physical analog to what the digital equivalent is that there's more transactions uh, that are hitting your kind of backend. That, that's kind of the core uh, philosophy. And then sometimes if you don't adapt, you kind of die. That's the Kodak example. Uh, the number of photographs are actually quite high, but Kodak doesn't exist now. 
Uh, so the other one is customers are kind of having a different kind of engagement. It's not just you have a point of transaction, you went to a bank or a branch, and then you, you have one interaction. Uh, but customers are expecting like a 24 by 7 engagement. And then you kind of see that you know, driven by, if you look at rideshare apps, you order a Uber, you are able to see the driver every turn that they take. Imagine the number of transactions or the number of uh, server, client server responses that you're actually getting in that. Uh, same thing with uh, you know, delivery apps, same thing with airlines, you can track your baggage, you can track uh, the flight. Um, so that kind of a continuous engagement is being requested by the customers. And, and there are kind of equivalent analogs to that in, 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 um, in the banking space where you want to track transactions, you want to track uh, application status, you want to track uh, the mortgage application status. So there are a lot of tracking that needs to be done. So that actually has an impact on the um, uh, how we kind of evolve the architecture. And the last piece is that uh, you know the complexity of the products is changing. Uh, so. Uh, not just we have you know four business lines, but but within business line we have a lot of products, and these products are being bundled, rebundled, and then sold. Um, so that means that the architecture of a monolith, you know, cannot kind of function very well. Many different different teams cannot work on it parallelly. So all of those are maybe standard things that you guys all heard. So I'm not going to get too much deeper into that, but these are some of the main drivers for why we went on this journey. So if you look at how the sort of the architecture uh, was, um, I mean, this is a very simplified version of it. Uh, there's a UI. Um, most likely, it was a mobile app or a web app or a banker app. And we used to have a thin domain layer. Uh, which it was not, there was no in business logic or anything, but just was an, um, like an API translator, um, some level of security, um, uh, like a gateway kind of a thing. And then that would hit the mainframe. And mainframe had the business logic, uh, the rules validation, and, and also the database. Um, so this is how it was. And then, you know, simple example is that you change an address, flows through all the way to the mainframe, uh, checks for the address validation, uh, and then it saves it. And then you can retrieve the same information. And then behind the scene, uh, this is what I was talking about. Uh, when you swipe a credit card transactions, they don't come through the, your uh, mobile app or web app, but they're coming, you know, updating the mainframe from, from the back end side of it. Uh, so whether it's your ACH transactions or whether it's your credit card transactions, they're all coming. So these are all, think of them as, uh, you know, uh, CRUD operations, either being new records are being created, new records are being read, or they're being updated or deleted. That, that's pretty much the entire gamut. So, of course, you can read the transactions. Uh, you know, the typical use case is you, you know, um, you want to see your transactions list. You ask the mainframe, the mainframe serves the data, and, and the data is kind of shown in the UI. Nothing fancy. Uh, quite simple, and this is how it worked. Uh, and and th there are kind of few problems or few few things that are kind of concerned. One is the, as I said, the mainframe is a single monolith, um, so many teams can't work on it. Um, that's one. And then the capacity is, you know, you're stuck with that capacity. Um, uh, so all the standard, I'm not going to even go into a lot of these details, but but. You guys know that every company probably wants to get away from the mainframe. So, uh, and the reasons why is kind of very simple. Uh, so, how are we kind of doing it, and and what's the scope of this particular conversation? So, uh, of course, all the new things that we're building, we're not building on the mainframe. Uh, so, uh, that that's the simple one, uh, and and I'm not going to go over that. And the second one is we are migrating some of the reads. Um, out of the mainframe to open source and other software. So that's kind of the main focus of this uh, talk. Um, and uh, the last one is that we are migrating some of the non-core functionality. When I mean non-core, uh, like the mainframes today also have functionality like your customer management has features like KYC checks. And, and, and they're not 
that they're not actually processing any money transactions like ACH or credit card. So they are a little bit easier to migrate. So those are the ones that we are targeting probably third. And the last one is, of course, migrating the actual core, which is you know, complex and, uh, and actually expensive. So th these are the ways that we are doing it. And this is how the sort of the cost and the complexity happens. And for this particular talk, I'm going to focus only on how we migrated the reads uh, away from the mainframe to, to, to open source. And then, of course, uh, and this is the starting point, uh, the previous architecture. Uh, um, and then, of course, nothing changes. Uh, this, the, the read patterns, the write pattern remains the same. All the writes are actually happening to the my, uh, mainframe. Uh, the, the writes like address change from your mobile app, the customer is doing it, or the backend transactions that are coming from your ACH uh, and your credit card processing are all coming from exactly the same. So what we did is we first put a module on the, on the mainframe. We modified the mainframe code to publish an event for every CRUD operation, for mostly for the updates uh, and then creates. So, uh, and then that module basically publishes it to an event bus. Uh, that event bus is a combination of, uh, there is an API that abstracts the Kafka, there is Kafka, and then there is a Spark that reads it uh, from, from, from the streaming infrastructure and then puts it in Cassandra. Um, and then from Cassandra, we have the domain layer, uh, which is Spring Boot based uh, and where the business logic now resides. And then of course, when the read request happens, the read request is actually going to the domain layer now to the, to the, to the uh, right hand side and then it hits the Cassandra. Uh, so this is a, in a, in a, you know, from an architectural pattern, if you look at it, this is a standard CQRS pattern uh, um, where the writes are happening onto the sort of the left-hand side and the reads are happening onto the uh, right-hand side. And then, and then, yeah, probably, yeah. So okay, on the domain layer here. Uh, so one other benefit that we get out of moving the data away from the mainframes is that the domain layer could be a lot more sophisticated. We enhance the data. Uh, when I mean enhanced, uh, for example, in the, the traditionally you would see the transactions to be like very simple. Uh, but these days, most of the transactions are actually enhanced. You will see the address of where you shopped. Uh, you would see the category of where you shopped. Um, so all of that could be kind of enhanced in the domain layer. And then uh, we also built uh, a voice uh, capability that you can actually search the transactions. Um, and then a lot of voice capability was built, uh, enhancement was built, search capability was built. So all of those capabilities which didn't exist in the previous uh, system, we were able to kind of do that. That's the benefit other than reducing the cost. Cost was driver, but, but not the most important one. Um, so building the new capability, as I said, was, was, was the driver. So I'll take some questions uh, in the later so that you know, we could. Uh, so what are the uh, main uh, learnings or the main things that we were supposed to take care of? There were many of them. I'm not going to go over all of them. Uh, but at least some of them I'm going to sort of dig deeper. Uh, and then the first one is, of course, uh, mainframes are known for their reliability, data consistency, uh, and then security. So reliability was probably the, you know, the highest. And if you look at the mainframe reliabilities, uh, typically they are in the range of almost three nines and getting close to four nines. There are some of the maintenance windows, but, but they're actually pretty high bar to meet. So when we went through the open source, uh, uh, most of the technologies that we picked are uh, distributed uh, and redundant. Uh, like if we take Kafka, you know, that's, a, that's a great example of it's redundant, it's distributed, Cassandra is uh, distributed and redundant. And then if you look at even Spark, 
uh, you could run it in Kubernetes. And that's how we ran it uh, in Kubernetes, so that you could get the distributed and redundant. Same thing with the Spring Boot, the domain layer. We ran it in um, the Kubernetes, uh, so that you would get it distributed, scaled, uh, and highly available across data centers. Both all of them were built highly available across all data centers. So that way we could actually you know, hit the first bar, which is you know, the reliability should be higher than uh, the mainframes. And then the next one, uh, if you look at uh, the, the scale, uh, the mainframes are you know, good at scale, uh, but, but they don't scale up when the volumes go up. And of course, when, uh, as I kind of explained, the main reason why we are migrating is the, 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 the curve of the digital transactions are actually going up significantly much more. Um, so if you look at the, even the uh, events that happen in the financial industry that, you know, uh, like stimulus checks during COVID, the traffic actually went up like nine times. Um, so we need to have capacity that we can ramp up very quickly, uh, which was harder. Uh, and that's one of the problems that we have to kind of solve. Uh, and then the next one, uh, as I said, the, the pipe that we built uh, between, between the mainframe and Cassandra, there are many different business lines that are actually using it. And as I said, as consumer, retail, wealth, uh, many different business lines are kind of using that pipe. So we didn't want it to be built as a custom pipeline for, for every business line or every particular event. Uh, we wanted to build it once, and, and, and building it once actually increases reliability you know, significantly because every team doesn't have to test that pipe. Uh, and, and I can go over some of the features that we built over the pipe in the presentation. So there are a lot of um, uh, core capability that we built on the pipe. Um, so all the data pipelines of every business line are basically configuration driven. Uh, not, there's no code that, that these teams are developing actually. Uh, and then the next one, which is probably the most significant one, which I'll kind of little dig deeper is the, is the data transfer, um, which is if somebody is actually doing a transaction on the mainframe, the time it takes to go to the next screen is typically around one second. Uh, so we, we had to kind of match that. The, then the data transfer between the mainframe to Cassandra has to happen in less than a second. So that's the uh, sort of the reliability. The data transfer is probably sort of the biggest problems that we had. Uh, and then as I said, there is, uh, there is, other than the scalability, there are issues on the peak traffic uh, because once the Kafka topics are there, uh, you can get a sudden burst of traffic uh, because the batch processing happens on the mainframe, middle of the night. And then suddenly there is a big spike of transactions that you will see for the settled payments. Uh, and then for the, most of the day, there kind of, there's no traffic. Uh, so it's very bursty. There are peaks, but bursts of traffic is another thing that we solved for. Uh, and the next, most of the third order ones are the data related ones that I'm gonna sort of dig deeper. Uh, the, the, the detection of missing events. In a file-based transfer, it's actually quite easy to figure out end of the file because you, know, you have 1,000 records. You, know, you put 1,000 records, clean slate, everybody's happy. There is auditability, there is tracking, uh, but in a stream, you don't know when you began, when you end, you can't do accounting on it. So we had to solve for that problem. So the, and, and the ones that are in italics is the one that I'm gonna dig deeper, so I'm gonna go. And then the errors, actually. Um, so there are kind of few kinds of errors. Um, one is, the, is, is any bugs, basically. And then you know, any software testing that you do, you cannot kind of test for the millions of records that are there. There's no way it's possible. So we had to figure out a way uh, that even though we can deploy the code and we test it to best of our abilities, can we test this data in real time as, as we kind of add more data to it. Um, so I'll go, and then we also built a fail safe switch. That, that means that we are running both the Cassandra version and the mainframe version of it, just in case that, that something goes wrong, 
can we actually switch? Uh, because that was key. It may not be for the entire life, but at least for the six months, three months, uh, while we do the deployments that we learn and then fix any bugs, in the worst case, you have a fail-safe switch. That was probably the, the good reason that we got the uh, approvals, because there was always a fail-safe switch. And the next is because we had to react to any real-time events, like if the SLA goes significantly higher in the pipe, uh, greater than one second, then we had to kind of make a decision, whether it, is it impacting customers, uh, and a lot of things like that. So we had to build a, uh, like a robust alerting and monitoring system in the entire pipe, uh, and even Cassandra, so that to make sure that, uh, so these were some of the sort of, you know, a lot more problems, but these are the ones that could make to the slide. Uh, so these are the three things that I'm going to sort of, in the interest of the time, that we're going to go deeper into. Uh, so, again, just to kind of summarize, we had the mainframe, mainframes publish two MQ series, uh, and there was a listener on the MQ series uh, that would pick it up from the MQ series, publish to the Spring Boot Kafka Spark infrastructure, and then that puts it into the uh, NoSQL with, with an atomic uh, write. And when we mean atomic write, if there were multiple tables, we would write it atomically so that there is no inconsistency in the data. That's the one. But here, when we started off with, you know, the the latency was almost around five seconds. Uh, and and as I said, one second latency was the whole project would be kind of irrelevant if if you didn't do one second. So we had to really really work hard to actually get there, and then we did a lot of performance tuning, like partitions, write throughput memory settings, et cetera, and, and all through the pipe. And some of the other key things where we're going to be, we had to learn and move away. One is from the micro-batching in the, in the streaming to, to continuous streaming. And the next one is uh, checkpointing, which was probably sort of a learning that we had that Spark would do checkpointing to a file server, and that was actually very expensive. Um, so we checkpointed to to actually the NoSQL itself. Uh, and when we write the data, we actually did the checkpointing to that saved considerably, actually. So our latency is, is, is less than a second, uh, and mostly at 500 milliseconds, mostly. Um, but this was, you know, this probably took the most effort. effort. Uh, and the next one is, is, the, uh, is the detection of missing events. So again, mainframe, uh, MQ series, Kafka, and then the Cassandra on the side. Uh, so what we did is whenever the data gets written to the MQ series, there is an entry in the journal. Uh, journal think of journal as just a uh, uh, table, um, like with, uh, with a message ID, unique. So the inspiration but for this came from like the package tracking. Uh, like if you look at FedEx tracking or UPS tracking, they track every package, packet. Either. So we wanted to track every event. The analogous of that is very simple. So every every event that got published got a unique ID. Uh, we stored that uh, unique IDs in the journal table, and then when when the Spark job inserted those rows of data into Cassandra, again it wrote the journal entries uh, for what are the uh, event IDs or tracking IDs. And every hour, we would go back and then make sure that these uh, packets are actually compared. Uh, and then, you know, as I said, m multiple business lines, so there's a lot of data there, but, but still not too bad. Uh, we can actually do the comparison. Um, so that, and, and the next one is kind of important because we are a financial services company, the order of the data is very, very important. Uh, so if you miss the data, we, we wouldn't go back to the queue because the latest data could actually change. So to preserve that order, we go back to the mainframe and then get the data and then insert it. Uh, Is there 
and it opened the city, and it was considered since it was the right library, the founding library was open to the government. Why did it just jump on that? Look, at, we'll get back to, uh, I'll finish that. There's only one more slide, and then okay. we'll get back. So the, 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 the next one is kind of a uh, uh, little bit of an extension on that one. This one was for, uh, think of the, the sort of the packets or the FedEx packets being delivered. Now, did I deliver all the contents? Uh, because that was also the problem. Because uh, if there is any bug in the code, uh, and instead of updating it, one column, we updated it, other column. Um, and of course, there are so many edge cases uh, that that you cannot ever even test in in kind of uh, in a uh, uh, production environment or in a, in a in a IT UAT testing environment. So what we did is we we export out the data from the mainframe. Uh, you know, we already have existing processes which would you know take the delta data and then send it across to different systems. Uh, so we took advantage of that snapshot daily snapshot. And then, and then, we 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 take that snapshot and then run a data reconciliation uh, program that would basically uh, hit the the Cassandra APIs and then get the the data out from them and then compare uh, actually row by row uh, basically on on all the data. And then, of course, this has its own problems. Uh, it has. Uh, uh, the big problem with this one was that there are a lot of false positives that you will get uh, because time has changed uh, because the nightly batch is, is uh, and the new data would have actually hit the uh, Cassandra after the midnight. Uh, so we have to make sure we write the logic to suppress all the false positives and then get the true positives out of this. So that took us some time to build the true positives, uh, but, but we were able to fix kind of a lot of records. Uh, and then there's some examples. Uh, there were bugs on the on sort of the mainframe uh, on what events would not get published. So you would have some mis missing records and, and there are kind of orphan records um, and kind of mismatches. And this one took care of that, that the contents of the packet are actually logically delivered to the Cassandra side. And, and some of the reasons for the, all these data checks is we are kind of a bank. <laughs> And then if you kind of see a post missing in social media or anything like that, no big deal. Nobody is worried. But if you miss a transaction, even if it's a dollar, you're going to get a call. Uh, so, and then we had a, what I didn't talk about is that, uh, you know, we had a rollout strategy. Uh, we rolled it out to uh, a select group of employees and a larger employee base, and then to small percentage of customers. So that itself, the whole thing was all to make sure that the data and the and and the reliability, all of them are uh, there. So that's pretty much the end of the talk. Uh, and then, as kind of three highlights from this, one is that the reason why we kind of rearchitected this is not because of um, you know, cost savings was one of them, but but to. Uh, do more services for the customers and to be ready for the customer when um, when the scale up happens. And the next one is that the open source was actually useful uh, and critical. And then we had to build the additional data checks uh, and parity. And, and that's what, so yeah, open for questions. Let me see how many minutes we've got left. Okay, looks like around 10 minutes. For question, sure, and I'll come back to your question. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, were there any considerations for using open source software as a major service in the institution where they say, oh, how are we going to get support if something breaks? So, uh, yes, uh, I mean, support was one, and then we also had, uh, you know, the vulnerability fixes, and then making sure that we are running the latest, and then we have to fix the vulnerabilities. And that. so, yes, uh, there was a larger drive for more open source within the bank, uh, and we actually have an open source office too now. And um, and that said, if I kind of go back, uh, some pieces of it was kind of open source supported by uh, vendors, and some wasn't. Uh, 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 yeah, like for example, Spring Boot. Thank you. Yeah. 
just a quick questions like how long was the migration effort so the migration effort if you look at all the business lines they're still kind of moving the workloads uh, so some workloads have kind of moved and then we are in kind of production uh, so if we go back to sort of the core engineering effort that needs to be built was that the streaming pipe that we built uh, was, was one of the core engineering efforts. The Cassandra was already in uh, production for a different workload already because I said all the new domains were already moving to a different uh, platform, so they were already on Cassandra. Uh, so this pipe was uh, probably took us like you know six, seven months to kind of build first to, so that every pipeline that was being built don't have to kind of do all of the data checks, all of them, uh, you know, uh, the journaling, and all of that came free for them. Uh, so, and then the the each pipeline, you know, if you kind of add that plus the the release mechanism, which is about releasing it to the employee and you know going through that cycle, took around eighteen months. So that means that when you kind of swipe the card kind of a transactions, all that happens on the mainframe. Yeah. Uh, I mean, that was not the use case, but but potentially we could actually do that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I don't think the. I mean, I don't want to go. Uh, you know, speak on on audit, uh, but but I don't think there's any. The restriction on a system. It's just the checks and balances that that probably went into the mainframe, and then somebody needs to replicate all of that uh, for for that function on on the uh, on the open source side or the Cassandra side. Yeah, I mean, just the end of perspective is, you know, the technology has been fantastic. I think it's been decision making and all this. Are they open to Yeah, I mean, all the reads and writes the reads are happening, and the customers are looking at the data. Uh, in a way, customers look at the data every day. Every, you know, like from an auditability, it's a, there are two different functions. The customer actually checks it in some sense, but but auditor, the you know the mainframe is still probably the source of it. Okay. Yeah. Um, given given everything that you had to do to make a new service layer work to provide a functionality that to your user they don't notice any difference. Yeah. Why would you build a new domain to serve this as opposed to enhancing your existing domain with a materialized view of the transaction? Um, so uh, let me, what do you mean by materialized? So, so, so in the left hand side, mm -hmm. existing transaction, I make a change and then the change is reflected back to the user in a presentation layer. Mm -hmm. Why would I build a new domain and all of this to store the secondary view rather than saying, hey, domain that deals with, uh, I don't want to say customer identity information, but like the customer as an entity, why wouldn't I say, all right, you're the domain that owns the customer, you build a materialized view. And eventual consistency will say, hey, at the end of the day, when the mainframe runs its batch, which the bank considers as the actual final state of truth, why wouldn't I just say, oh, you maintain transient state and serve it back to the user. So if it's, I make an address change and it's not committed to the mainframe, I'll just serve it back from the domain directly. Why build all the rest of this stuff? So uh, the domain was actually adding um, as for, for enhanced transactions, for example. Enriched transactions, as we called it, uh, you had additional data which you know, we didn't want to store in the mainframe to begin with. Uh, so the, the the credit card transaction, ACH transactions, all of them that are there in Cassandra, are more than what's there in the mainframe. We added, appended more data to it, uh, and there are kind of search indexes because you know, for example, in the mainframe you cannot search, give me all transactions that are on McDonald's. Uh, so that's there in the new domain. So the CDC process that moves it into Cassandra is not the sum of the data set. There's stuff that's fed directly into Cassandra that the mainframe doesn't know about. Yes. Okay. Yeah. That makes more sense. Yeah. Go ahead. Is it fair that thank you. No problem. Is it fair then that, that Cassandra layer is really to optimize the consumer's experience, like the read 
So it's almost like a BFF or what I would call a BFF pattern in a way ju that just serves the, the front end visibility of the data? Yeah, so uh, yes, in this use case, definitely in this use case, but if you go back to the use case that new domains are built outside of the mainframe, for that Cassandra was a read write. Yeah. And, and, and for the second one is the whole talk about, yeah. yeah. You know, it's funny, I do most of my work in healthcare and it's always interesting to me how many overlaps there are between some of our different industries. I've been working on a project to separate out our on-prem SQL database to have our cloud NoSQL database, going through the change data capture, being able to enrich and have a completely separate database just for reads. I mean, this is like, you're preaching to the choir uh, <laughs> on this one. I'm curious though, in the CDC process, uh, using the, the address change as an example, knowing that an address change is good, but what you might need to publish to Kafka would include additional information, maybe like the yeah. customer's name or yes. their, yeah. uh, their favorite color, their favorite TV show, yeah, for yeah. instance. Um, yeah. how, how did you handle that at a very atomic level where the change is happening, uh, I'm guessing on an addresses table, but it might actually need more information to be able to hydrate the customer yeah. record. Yeah. So there was a, I was talking actually to Matt before this, we did like phase one of this before and, and, and we were successful partially. We took one or two use cases and we used actually CDC. Uh, and, and when we scaled it up to like 40 different events then we actually had a lot of problems because if you do CDC, CDC is, you're exactly right, it's a granular level. And then all the logic used to sit in the pipe to kind of put it together. Uh, and then, then we had a lot of things where you can't put the Humpty Dumpty together actually. Uh, so then we kind of abandoned that. Uh, so in this model, that's why we had to actually modify the mainframe uh, to publish a complete event. Uh, so there is no translation or pretty much we avoided all translations and, and putting the package together in the pipe. The pipe is just dumb pipe. Yes, it has some smarts in, in checking the validation and all that stuff, but, but th we don't open the package and then see the contents and then put it together. Good, that's what I had to do too. That's good. Um, and if you could go forward two slides. Um, one of the things that, uh, it's, it's not that one, it's the one where you had like the pretty pictures and stuff okay. and like Kafka. Yeah, yeah. 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 Um, so one of the things that some of our teams do before they go live is they will actually hook their pre-production environment up to the production Kafka and before they go live, they'll run essentially like the, the transactions live and then they'll run it through their pre-production environment compare what's in the NoSQL database for those same records in prod against what they pre-processed in pre-prod. And okay. if they match, then they know that there's no regression. It only really works if you have some sort of near real-time asynchronous write of your mainframe so that you can do real apples to apples. Um, just curious if that's you know a strategy that you all have taken or if I have given everyone in the room a really good idea that hopefully you can do because your mom's data and healthcare matters a lot. Just like my mom, my mom is actually a US bank customer. Oh, so, thank so thank you very much for making sure that her dollar transactions yeah. go through. <laughs> thank, thanks for being a customer. Yeah, I'll let her know. <laughs> So uh, we, we didn't try that, but uh, our kind of deployment strategy was, was roll it out to the uh, employees uh, first and then get to the customers. Okay, good job. Did you, did, you have to, did you have to write special logic into the event to do that based on like... No, uh, actually good question. So uh, no, the data sync was happening for all of them. Uh, but so the, the, the almost the like the, the yeah, the serving of the, because what we could do with all this, we could actually check this. Uh, but the checking of the journaling, the, the data reconciliation, any alerting, monitoring, all of that could be tested, but the impacted customers only would be the employees because we made that switch in the, in the UI layer. Yeah, the UI layer. That's where we kind of made that, you know, just select a random list of employees and then, you know, 
uh, switch it between these two. Sure. I'll, I'll deliver it, just a second. Don't throw it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm curious, like with, you know, the storyline you told at the beginning, a lot of the work you did was to build confidence in this yeah. migration. So now that you've got that under your belt, like what's the, the next big tent pole thing on the sort of cake, layer cake that you're showing? Yeah. Like so what's the big next problem? Actually, to make all of this kind of relevant. <laughs> so uh, uh, we are probably in the, in the third stage now. Uh, we are trying to think of moving all the non-core. Um, and then actually, you know, started uh, thinking about the migration of the core uh, right now. Does migrating that non-core functionality, do you find like you're having to convince more of like the business folks that sort of rely on that? Like now I have a whole different confidence building job. So uh, like, like if you look at the non-core, they're exactly like the new domains. Uh, mm -hmm. It's just that, you know, they were grandfathered into the mainframe. Uh, so uh, the, the first thing that actually built the confidence in open source was actually the new domains. Mm -hmm. Um, that was, of course, the, from a reliability perspective, we had that running for almost three years, even before we kind of attempted this. And as I said, we attempted smaller scale uh, syncs uh, for, for one event and two events, and then that was done on CDC. So there was some confidence that, yes, we could do it, but at scale that we, we failed and we built this. So MIPS is a driver, uh, so that, that's something that we actually kind of talk about it. The reason why it's not tangible at a, at a bottom line is this is what happens. While we are doing this, you're getting new customers, just the new customers and their rights, and then we acquire new banks. Uh, and of course, we get the new rights from that bank's traffic. So you will not see a tangible um, baselining of the MIPS cost per se, because the new customers are being added all the time. Um, so if you track it as a MIPS cost per transaction per customer, yes, you will see a decline. Um, so it depends upon how you do the math. Uh, yeah, go ahead. So yeah, that's a good question too. Like if we look at all the four cakes, the mainframe cost would have gone up with the new domains. Uh, uh, and then yeah, the cost would have gone up basically. Uh, so you may see a flat line, uh, but, but you're actually declining because considering all the things that would have gone on the mainframe uh, are not there. That's a bit of hard sell for the finance, but, but that's true. <laughs> Prevention and unrealized cost. Yeah. It would have been more expensive. Yeah. No, th that is true. We say that, but it's a little bit harder. But yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, a little bit off topic. But um, did you implement this in the cloud, private cloud? Um, so yeah, we, we have a version of uh, private cloud. Uh, um, all the uh, Kubernetes uh, things, uh, like here, the 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 Spring Boot, like I was trying to get to that. Yeah, the Spring Boot ran on Kubernetes. The Kafka is on a VM. Uh, the Spark is on Kubernetes. The Cassandra is on, on, on VMs. And the uh, uh, domain layer is again in Kubernetes, uh, internal cloud. I mean, we wouldn't use, uh, uh, you know, uh, probably no SQL for that. Uh, but, but yeah, we, we, sort of yeah, we would design, uh, we would design uh, something different because core migration is a totally different track uh, with totally different set of problems. Uh, yeah. Okay. Thank I think you. the next talk.